Welcome, everybody. I'm Kamal Ahmed. I'm the economics editor of the BBC. And let it, let it never be said that economics is not the new rock stars, because we have three people here who have filled out this large auditorium to discuss the small issue of the state of capitalism, no less. Ten years on from the financial crisis. Now, I became business editor of the Telegraph uh, in 2009, and I remember meeting Bob Diamond, the chief executive of Barclays Bank, uh, big cheer for Barclays, and he asked me a year later um, when I thought all this would be over. Uh, and I drew myself up to my full height, and I thought, well, Bob, I've been couple more years of this uh, rather miserable economic news, and I'm sure we'll be back to, you know, proper strong growth. And here we are, uh, ludicrous um, economic forecast as ever by me, which was totally wrong, and we're still here uh, 10 years later dealing, frankly, with the funk of the financial crisis. Now, of course, there have been some big trends for 2018, which look a little bit more positive. I'm probably net positive at the moment. Uh, we've had synchronized uh, growth in the main drivers of the global economy for the first time since the financial crisis, but also against that, quite interestingly, we've had synchronized monetary tightening, very gentle, still in a weird world where we have monetary policy set for a recession and global growth now predicted to be close on 4%. How long can that last for? In the UK, as, a, as we have had across many developed economies, we have this historic income squeeze. There have only been three general elections since the Second World War where voters have gone to the polling booths in Britain suffering an income squeeze. And they are 1945, 2010, and 2017. That shows the great historic nature of what we have experienced, this long income squeeze. Each of those elections didn't work out that well for the incumbent. Winston Churchill, who'd won a war, lost. Gordon Brown, who had saved the globe, he had told us, lost. Theresa May, almost lost in 2017. So that shows the fundamentals. When you ask people whether they want change or more of the same, in the present situation, they're going to go for change, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Brexit, whether it's Jeremy Corbyn. Someone who can offer a solution to where we are is the, uh, the person or the issue that tends to have success. We've had 10 years where returns to capital have outweighed returns to labour. It was uh, Lord Adair Turner, the former head of the Financial Services Authority, who said to me, that capitalism over the last decade had fundamentally failed in its central promise to the public that each year, if you worked harder and played by the rules, you'd be a little more wealthy. That has not been true for the past decade. The last four quarters of uh, data on borrowing and saving, households have become net borrowers for the first time in the data set in the UK, which goes back to the early 1990s. We are borrowing our uh, income that we need to keep our lifestyle at a certain level. These are fundamental issues. How much of it is connected with the financial crisis? So I am joined by three people of such planetary brain power, it's going to be difficult keeping them sort of uh, on topic and under control. But it's a great pleasure um, to, to uh, welcome them to the stage. So, Mariana Mazzucato, she is Professor in, Econ in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value and Director of the Institute for Innovation at University College uh, London. She's advised policymakers all over the world, uh, including our dear old Jeremy Corbyn, I believe, for a relatively brief period, but nevertheless, uh, dear old Jeremy uh, Corbyn. And she's authors also two very, very uh, key books, as well as many others, but two key books uh, which touch on these um, uh, issues, Rethinking Capitalism and the Entrepreneurial State. And she is about to have published her book, The Value of Everything, Makers and Takers in the Global Economy. Ma uh, welcome, Mariana. Uh, Mervyn King, I think the first person on this stage that is not only a lord, but is a double sir, which must be a first. 
So title inflation for Mervyn King, but maybe not much else, not much else other inflation. But um, uh, Lord Mervyn King, of course, governor of the Bank of England, 2003 to 2013. One of the men credited with being the architect of the remarkable uh, coming together of central bank governors around the world. Without them, who knows what the effect of the credit crisis, the huge withdrawal of, of mainstream bank finance to the global economy may have been. Mervyn King, one of the architects of the remarkable um, synchronized response of uh, central banks, author of The End of Alchemy, Money, Banking and the Future of the Global Economy. Uh, welcome, Lord King. And on his left, Torsten Bell, director of the Resolution Foundation, a uh, think tank which focuses on uh, standards of living, on that incomes issue in particular, and how is it we can make economies work for lower income, uh, low and middle income uh, people. Formerly director of policy for the Labour Party and worked in the Treasury as special advisor to the Chancellor, Alistair Darling. We are going to chit chat here for a bit, which you are welcome to listen into. Uh, and then after about half an hour, 40 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to come to questions uh, from the audience. There will be people circulating with microphones and little paddle boards, so look out for them as we get towards a kind of at 7.50, and then we'll get a good conversation going with you and with us here on stage. So, Marianne, if I could start uh, with you, and let's go, let's go back. Uh, tell us a story, Marianne, about where you were at the time of the financial crisis, and I think that also I'd be interested, Marianne, as an economist, um, did it become clear to you, and at what moment, was it Lehman, was it Northern Rock, was it Royal Bank of Scotland, was it you know, what was going on in Europe, other issues that you were looking at, did you think it became clear to you that this was something so fundamental that possibly 10 years on we'll be talking about it in the same way we still talk about the 1930s and what it meant? Right. So, first of all, in September 2008, I was... It was during a time that I was in Italy on maternity leave, and I had just had four children in five years, so I thought my problems are much bigger than anything <laughs> that I'm seeing here on TV now. Um, but I was lucky that at the time I was um, directing actually a big research project, which was very much related to the theme of what I was seeing on TV happening that night. And the research project funded by the European Commission, which by the way, tends to fund a lot of the research that many of us academics do, and that's why we're extremely worried about Brexit, um, was called Finance, Innovation and Growth. And I remember when I was watching TV that particular night, I thought this is a perfect conclusion which of night, a report. Which night, Mariana? Which, when did you think, wow, this is... Was layman. It, with layman? it was layman. Yeah, yeah. And I remember that I thought, because I was actually writing the conclusion for a report, that we were writing, and the, the whole grant, which was called Finance, Innovation, and Growth, actually had been looking sector by sector, but also um, country by country, at the degree to which finance as a sector had become de-linked to different uh, areas that we know actually cause long-term growth, not short-term kind of speculative growth. And my first kind of question in my head was, is this really just about these particular banks? Or is it actually about the financing model of um, how the sector had, again, become delinked, but also the relationship between finance and actually how companies themselves were um, being, uh, uh, if you want, incentivized. So this whole issue around corporate governance, which I'm sure we'll come back to before. But the big question for me when I was sort of seeing it sort of play out on television was, this is bigger than just the banks. How long will it take for the conversation to move on? Um, and in fact, I think it took a very long time for it to be uh, a bigger question, for too long, I think. And, and partly that was why I don't think we've reached the point where we should be at. Too long it remained a question of finance. How do you reform finance versus how do you actually reform the system in which finance should be kind of central in terms of fostering growth? And how many people, Mariana, did you think fundamentally shared, how many economists or, or people in the finance sector or people in the corporate world before the crisis really bit and the public had to engage in it, mm -hmm. shared your concern that there was this delinking between yeah. what growth looked like it was doing and what was actually happening. 
I'd say few, but even in my little narrow area, which is the kind of economics of innovation, trying to really understand what drives companies like Apple and Microsoft, what do we know about you know, what sort of brought them about? I remember that one of the things we kept having to sort of stress in our conversations with policymakers, this was before the crisis, was stop talking about the need to have more finance, right? This idea even of the credit crunch or the fact that SMEs needed more financing or that there wasn't enough finance to do the kind of things that were perceived as needed. I remember that we often, myself and my team of researchers, this was not just an individual battle, we kept saying, think just as much about the quality of the finance. So, you know, even things that were very different from Lehman, the fact that you had a venture capital sector, which was increasingly short-term, exit-driven, trying to exit in three years through an IPO or a buyout, we were observing was really affecting in a very negative way what at the time was the kind of uh, emergence of the biotech sector. And you had dysfunctions occurring in the way that production, distribution, and innovation were occurring because of the quality of the finance. And yet you, again, kept falling back to this notion of, you know, we need more money to do stuff as opposed to let's really think about the structure of the funds and the finance and make sure that they're structured properly because money and finance are not neutral. How you structure finance actually affects what happens in the real economy. And that's like a big point, which I actually continue to have to often talk yeah. about. Finance yeah. is not neutral. Lord King, Mervyn, tell us, can you give us some insight to what it was like being a central bank governor as you became increasingly aware, obviously before the collapses began, um, as you became increasingly aware that something was so fundamentally, structurally wrong with our finance system? What, what was the atmosphere like in the bank and what did you need to do? Well, it was a lot calmer than people might expect because those who watch the crisis on television <laughs> with you, uh, actually it was a little, little bit like seeing the highlights of a football match where you see two minutes and any match looks exciting if it, you just show two minutes. And the 10 minutes of news highlighted in the evening made the thing look more dramatic than it felt when you were working very long hours and dealing with individual banks and problems and you worked through them one by one. I think the, the, the more difficult part of it was trying to persuade people that, you know, certainly by the end of 2007, well before Lehman Brothers, it was clear that our banking system needed to be recapitalized, that is, it needed to have more equity capital in the banks to absorb losses, and that there's no way the banks could easily borrow money from the rest of the economy if people had lost confidence in it, and they wouldn't regain confidence unless the banks looked much safer. And I reckon it took seven or eight months before we managed to persuade people that this was the problem that had to be tackled. And I think that the British government uh, took that lesson, and the UK was, in fact, the first country to recapitalize the banks. And I remember going to Washington after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and the Americans by that stage had obtained money from Congress. They wanted to use that money to buy assets that had fallen in value, and they called them troubled assets. Actually, this would not have been a very sensible thing because the state would have been offered the worst of those assets. And instead, they used it to recapitalize their banks following our model. So I think that, that, that going through this, there was no one moment where you felt this is you know, drama. There were lots of moments that were critical and difficult and awkward decisions had to be made. But it was the never ending, it was, you know, in that sense, you, you mentioned Churchill earlier on. The Second World War lasted a, a less time than it did in handling the financial crisis. And at every stage in that crisis, there were you know, meetings which sometimes lasted all night or, and staff were up working hard to find a legal solution to a problem that had arisen. So I don't think it was in that sense, there was one moment of drama. There's no doubt that the, the date that most people use to date the crisis is the 9th of August 2007. Mm -hmm when the French bank PNB Paribas announced that it wouldn't uh, allow any further redemptions from its funds. And then people started to, and they, they pinned that on the US mortgage market, and then people started to become worried. And 
from then on, you could see the, the, the state of the banking system, their ability to borrow money, you know, waxing and waning during the time until Lehman Brothers, 12 months later, failed. And then the whole of the Western banking system would have collapsed had it not been for state intervention. Can I slightly reformulate, um, supposedly, the Queen's question, uh, which was, so, um, economists, why did nobody notice what was happening before it happened? I mean, this was a period up until 2007 or, or certainly 2008, and we started seeing the effects of the banking crisis in the real economy of the great moderation. Um, Gordon Brown, famously, the end of boom and bust in the UK. There have been criticisms that we became, the bank became too complacent about risk and about financial sector risk in particular. Um, how did you see it from inside? Um, there were these signals, but did, did you feel that the system, maybe the bank itself, had become a little complacent? No, and I think I would go back. If you, you asked it, Mariana, what was the date of the, mm. when the financial crisis began? For me, the underlying causes of it go right back to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the transformation of many previously centrally planned economies into market economies. They started to save a lot of money, particularly obviously in Asia. And from that date on, we saw this inexorable decline in long-term interest rates. When long-term interest rates go down, the prices of all assets, not just houses, but also shares and government bonds, go up. This is the reverse of what's happened this week, uh, on Friday and today. And it went up for 25 years. Now, all of this was visible, it was seen, and we could see the problems that arose from it. We had a very unbalanced world economy. We had some countries exporting a lot and others consuming a lot. We were in the consuming group together with the United States. China and Germany were in the in exporting group. This could not go on, that, that was clear. But no one country on its own had the ability to stop it happening. It would have required a coordinated approach which was not feasible until a crisis occurred. It's very striking that the only time you saw signs of cooperation internationally was really from the beginning of the crisis, late 2007, particularly strongly in the autumn of 2008, spring of 2009 with the G20 in London, which Gordon Brown chaired. But by the end of 2009, the enthusiasm for cooperation had disappeared and by 2010 it had gone. Why do you, you put that down to? Was that a mistake? Was that, is that a problem? That was a problem. It's, it's what I call in my book the prisoner's dilemma. That is that no one country or no one group of politicians has any incentive to be the first to sacrifice their domestic interests and their own political interests in favour of some global cooperation. And I think the IMF got distracted. Certainly in, from 2010 onwards, it got badly distracted by the crisis in the euro area and it got involved in that in a way which it probably shouldn't, and it should have seen its role as being out of the headlines, not in the uh, publicity and on television, and trying to point out to countries the need not to coordinate measures, all do the same thing, but to agree on the diagnosis of the problem and what had to happen to put it right. And I think my big concern today is that the underlying problems are still there so that the banking system is much safer than it was. Indeed, the crisis might not have evolved through the banking system. It could have come about through a crisis in exchange rates, and it, that one might have affected stock markets. In fact, it came about through the banking system because asset prices had risen very sharply uh, as interest rates came down. People needed to borrow more money to finance and to purchase those assets, and the banking system did what it was supposed to do, which is to provide mm. lending when people demand it at the interest rate that prevailed. The real problem was that interest rates were too low in many parts of the world and that the banking system allowed itself to grow rapidly without issuing more equity capital so that they would be in a position to absorb losses if and when a crisis came. Yeah. We'll come back to whether uh, the banks are in or how safe the banks are now and what threat they may still pose to the global economy. But Torsten, if I could come to you, advisor to Alistair Darling, Chancellor, of course, through uh, a lot of uh, this crisis. I was, always a, I was always astonished speaking to Alistair, as I was fortunate to do uh, through a lot of this time, and then interview him post. Um, 
the sort of the, the, the rather flabbergasted nature about how poor, poorly functioning the financial system was and that banks didn't, have to, didn't seem to have the most simple intelligence about how they operated, about what they operated, about the links between different bits of, the, of their banking system. Sort of rank ignorance of how they even worked themselves. Well, what do you put down the, the moment for you? And, and tell us where you were and, and what it felt like being in that kind of political eye of the storm in the same way that Mervyn was in the sort of set, the monetary or central bank and financial stability yeah. eye of the storm. Well, um... On events like this, I'm always slightly... This is basically like reliving trauma. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, um, the textbooks say you should only relive trauma. It's quite a dangerous thing to do. You should only do it with a really good therapist. <laughs> and we've got you. <laughs> the, um, so this is probably going to end the badly. But anyway, but since we're doing it, here we go. So the... Um, um, I mean, uh, uh, Lehman Brothers stands out as the moment that the world, where clearly policymakers, in this case US policymakers, had made a huge mistake... Um, and that it was the only point where it looked like there was an existential crisis to the world's financial system as opposed to individual countries' financial system. So there was clearly existential crisis for the Irish financial system, which went bust, and similarly for Iceland. But I'd say Lehman Brothers stands out as the kind of existential moment for everybody. And actually, I'd say the bit that highlights the best bits of decision-making for the reasons that Mervyn says about pushing recapitalization as the underpinning answer to the crisis... Uh, the immediate crisis, the, um, that's what stands out. The, um, but I'd say the crisis more felt like, I mean, I'm not sure I quite agree with Mervyn that there was, didn't feel like there was quite a lot of drama. I kind of could have done with a lot less drama, felt like. But anyway, the, um, I remember it seemed to be every, week, every weekend, every, we were working over the weekend to buy a different bank or to bail out a different bank or to reorganise a balance sheet of a different financial institution. But, the, um, um, but it... But it more felt like a long drag where every now and again different issues would come to the fore. Clearly, Northern Rock in Britain was the first big public noticeable thing. It had become clear over August 2007 that there were problems building uh, and that Northern Rock was the most likely fulcrum for them in the UK. But it's what, September the 13th, 14th, I think it is, in 2007, when it becomes clear we've got an institution that is, cannot go on. Um, actually, in retrospect... Uh, I think there's probably, although, it, although towards the end of 2007, early 2008, people start talking about, uh, at least in private, about the need for more capital in lots of British banks, the entire banking sector is largely in denial about that, which I think what well, you're yes, getting at, yes. Mervyn. I mean, the d degree to which people who ran our biggest banks, and remember British banks at this point were global banks mainly, RBS is the biggest bank in the world, Barclays is a huge international bank, even banks that you've kind of never heard of had become pretty international, they, um, at which people, would, they, people on the boards, even later on in 2008, when you're seeing Bear Stearns in the United States getting into serious trouble, would say to you, we've got no capital problem at all. We've, got, we've definitely got enough capital. Yes, there's a bit of a liquidity issue because no one will give us any money. But if you just sort that out, we've got they no... They just thought it was overnight lending. If overnight lending could be fixed... So some of them thought that, yeah, the yeah. problem is that people are having... A, they thought they had a version of a bank run, but it was manifesting itself in people not lending to them uh, overnight, as you say. Mm -hmm. the, um, and you know, they, We used to have a screen up in the, um, one of the rooms in the Treasury which had LIBOR which is the rate at which banks can borrow overnight, showing what was happening to it. That was definitely not a good idea for blood pressures. Uh, <laughs> it was largely doing this, uh, for mo large chunks of this, uh, not, not always, but for most of this um, uh, phase. So, the, um, so yes, definitely right up until individual banks picked up the phone and said, we cannot go on, and you have to, which was RBS in the autumn after Lehman Brothers, the um, Northern Rock earlier, um, most banks' boards were... I don't, know, I, can't, I, I don't want to say categorically whether they were complacent, as in they didn't think there was a capital problem, or they did not want to have said there was a capital problem until the mm. point of crisis. And if it, probably for different ones, it was probably different things. And it is, to be fair, quite hard to tell what looks like a liquidity problem to one person can look like a capital problem to somebody else. So it's not completely ridiculous, uh, but yes, everybody, right until the point at which they were saying, we're going to close the ATMs in three hours unless you do something, were... So I believe it was a conversation between Philip Hampton and Alistair Darling. Yes, that was one of the highlights. Yes. That, that would have made it to the uh, highlight show. <laughs> <laughs> it would have crept in. But it, I think it doesn't count as a goal. Well, it was the first and, time in my life I wrote a cheque for £35 billion. Pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a Christmas present. Last, your own balance sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree with Torsten's point 
that if America had a, had, had a different approach to recapitalization at the beginning, at the time of Lehman's, some of the effects of what happened could have been mitigated? No, so I don't think the Americans made a mistake. I think with Lehman Brothers, the best they could have done is nationalize it. They claim they didn't have the legal power to do it. That's not for me to say. But I think that even if they'd say that once, something else would have happened, as we saw in the two weeks after Lehman Brothers failed. So at one point or another, there would have been the need to recapitalize the whole system. And I think once people had understood that, then there would undoubtedly have been the realization that there was a sort of major problem. Uh, and the problem wouldn't have gone away until the banks had actually been recapitalized. In the States, that occurred in May 2009. And I think you can, that's the point where the banking crisis as such ended. Uh, some banks still needed to do more work, but people were confident that the system would, would carry on. But I think the, the, the extent to which we'd got into a position in which banks had borrowed too much money were over leveraged in that sense was there in 2007, beginning of 2008, and the banks, as Torsten said, were in denial. They adamantly refused to admit that this was the case. Many of the bigger banks had leverage ratios of 40 or 50 to 1, which meant that for every two pounds that they put in as shareholders' money, you know, 98 pounds were borrowed. Well, at most businesses, if you borrow 98% of your total capital, you are very fragile, to say the least. Northern Rock had a leverage ratio of 80 to 1. The extraordinary thing, of course, is with Northern Rock that according to the new international regulations introduced in Britain at the beginning of 2007, Northern Rock could say and did say that they were the best capitalized bank in the UK. And that's because the regulations, and this is my criticism of much of what's happened in the regulatory front, It takes years to draw up international agreements on regulations. By the time those regulations came in, the assumption was that the safest lending that banks could make were mortgages, and that it didn't matter how you financed yourself. Well, both of those were very bad assumptions. And yet, once the regulatory train had started, you couldn't stop it and direct it onto a different track. We still got that problem today. We still have that. Our regulation market. is sort of in the rear view mirror. I mean, we've, we, the, the, regula- the, the capital requirements have been redefined, etc. But it's still based on a view that a group of people meeting together in Basel from different countries think they know enough about the future to judge which assets are safe and which are riskier. And I think that's uh, an assumption of knowledge which is a very dangerous thing to believe in. And it's better, I mean, regulation works best when it's simple, not when it gets so complicated that people devise very detailed rules, which may be, have been perfect if we had applied them 10 years ago, but by the time the next crisis comes, these rules will not have actually done. At what level would you put the chance of another financial breakdown of a similar level to what we experienced in 2007, 2008? Well, the banking system as such is still risky in the sense that banks borrow short and lend long. And if the people who've lent to banks for short term, maybe not just overnight, but for three months, decide that it's too risky to lend to the bank for three months, because after all, you know, if you really, if you think something nasty could happen to a bank, why take the risk of lending for three months to the bank? You just get your money out, lend it to someone else for three months until the, the nervousness has gone away. Banks are still fragile in that sense. And we don't have a mechanism for doing anything other than throwing money at it if the crisis were to occur. And I think it's not difficult to see how and and where another crisis could come. The amount of debt in the world today is higher even just in the private sector than it was in 2007, relative to GDP. Uh, So there's plenty of scope in the next decade for not this time a French bank to announce that some of its funds can't be redeemed, but for a few people, maybe in China, maybe in emerging markets, a European bank or two, to say, we can't repay our debts. And once that happens, and people ask the question, well, the value of the assets on financial institutions around the world is the value of the loans that they've made. But if these loans can't be repaid, 
then their assets aren't worth as much as they say they are, and in which case the bank looks very fragile indeed. So we have not got to a point where we would be able to claim that the, we are immune to another crisis. That doesn't mean to say one is round the corner. And of course, you know, Torsten's description of banks being in denial, of, of thinking they were fine, that isn't true of banks today. The people running banks today are only too conscious that things can go badly wrong. But of course, at some point, the people who remembered the last crisis and who worked in banks will have retired. And at that point, banks will be run again by people who think, well, oh, this is terrific, you know, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, it, it, this is a natural human emotion. I remember being a student in the 1960s and thinking about the Great Depression. And I thought, you know, we're learning Keynesian economics. There will never be a Great Depression again. We know how to deal with it. And when you looked at the photographs of people from the 1930s, boy, did they look like fuddy duddies and hats and whiskers. You know, we were modern. We would never let this happen again. Well, we didn't have a Great Depression in most of the industrialized countries. Greece certainly did. Southern Europe has certainly had something comparable to that. But nevertheless, we had the deepest recession since the Great Depression and a collapse of the banking system which required massive state intervention, not in order to protect the banks, but in order to protect the economy from the banks. Mariana, give us uh, your view of where the economy is now and how linked... I, I raised a few of the structural issues that, the, uh, that certainly developed economies are facing uh, at the moment. How linked is that to the way that finance is still working? And what is your view about the huge move by central banks and govern governments to recapitalize the banks? Did they save the banks from themselves and therefore save the economy? Or did they actually simply cover with a wash, a huge wash of money, the fundamental problems that are still there? Right. So, I mean, coming back to my earlier comments, I think that, and in some ways, I haven't heard this perspective in terms of what the really kind of structural dysfunctions were in the economy where some of what you guys were talking about was kind of the symptom of the sickness, right? And what I would say was the structural kind of cause, which I would argue is still there today, and hence one should be extremely worried today, and as you just mentioned, the, the, the ratio of private debt to disposable income is basically at record levels, and that's what caused the financial crisis. It was private debt, not public debt. But the actual structural composition of the economy is, is still very sick, because the diagnosis was the wrong one. And why I think it's sick is you have two types of financialization. On the one hand, you have a financial sector that's basically still obsessed with itself. In other words, finance, finances, finance. Only something like 15% of funds from the sector, and by that I mean the widely defined, defined sector, um, actually goes into the real economy, into business, right? Um, and then you have the real economy, so businesses in different industries, whether it's pharmaceuticals, IT, or energy, which are also financialized, so they're not just there, sort of innocent little businesses needing this finance, which isn't coming to them. By financialized business, I mean businesses that increasingly, these are especially the large businesses, for example, the S&P 500, which are increasingly, so it's getting worse, uh, spending their profits, instead of reinvesting the profits back into production, innovation, new machinery, capital expenditures, in areas like share buybacks, so boosting stock prices, which boost stock options, which boosts, surprise, surprise, executive pay. Now, both of these problems then really hurt the economy, right? So this whole issue, for example, of you know, the robots are taking our jobs, they're not taking our jobs. Robots, or if you think of it in terms of mechanization, has been around for about 200 years. You know, David Ricardo already back in 1821 wrote a book called Principles of Political Economy, where chapter 31, don't ask me why I remember this, called On Machinery, was like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. You know, all these machines are taking jobs and they're going to reduce wages. But then what you had for 200 years since then was that, fine, some jobs might be, you know, taken in this area. But as long as profits from the, the investment in those machineries were then reinvested back in the economy, new jobs arose. So when you have this financialized real economy, you get a break in that mechanism. 
So you no longer have the profits going back in, which kind of creates a creative destruction kind of dynamic. And so this, um, this, this is a huge problem. And this, I would argue, is one of the key problems in terms of wage stagnation. We've had wage stagnation since the 1980s, so when we do look at private debt figures, it's also because people have had to, in some ways, just to retain existing living st standards, take out debt, right? It's not that they were just so foolish, all these stupid people taking out debt that they shouldn't have been. They actually had to in order to compensate for, for these stagnant wages, which were partly, I would say greatly, a cause of, this, um, of, of these profits not being reinvested. And I would say that both these elements of financialization have not been tackled. A company like Apple, by the way, under Steve Jobs, almost all the profits under Jobs were reinvested back into the company. Under Tim Cook, <laughs> Apple has become one of the most financialized companies with you know, over 100 billion share buyback schemes. You know, so corporate governance, how businesses are structured, matters. And the big change was from the 1980s onward, so I would agree that the problem began in the 1980s, um, where this kind of notion that the, that the point of companies is to maximize shareholder value is actually quite a recent change, and that was a revolution. Before that, there was more this idea of stakeholder value, that there was different uh, uh, actors in the economy that produced value, and you know, workers in a company and you know, public actors, et cetera, were just as important as the shareholder. And lastly, the, just the Cold War uh, you know, mention that you made, so 1989, I would say that just almost in a cartoon image-wise, one could also argue that the crisis also began when some of the smartest people in the world, <laughs> so some of the top scientists in Eastern Europe, ended up going to Wall Street. And someone once told me a joke that you know, the financial crisis was basically caused when you had this massive shift before that, you had you know, people in, say, a college classroom, the smartest ones, ended up being the managers, and the kind of dumb jocks went to go on Wall Street. When you had a reverse of that, the smartest people going to Wall Street, and some of the, uh, I don't want to say dumb people becoming managers, but this huge reversal of where energy and, and yeah. expertise went. Now, Mary, let's go, we're coming up to the, where I want to bring in the audience, but let's go for the three of you, but the same question. You've given it the diagnosis, quite a lot of the diagnosis of why the economy is, is where it is. Give us just two solutions that could pull us out of the situation we find us in. Well, the first is, and this is sort of a separate, well, just then as a continuation of what I just said, so it's more um, logical, we need to definancialize the real economy. There also has to be incentives for that. Currently, we actually have incentives which reward companies which are uh, short-term and speculative over those that actually invest in the long run. So something like capital gains tax, and this was actually labor in this country that did this, capital gains tax is structured extremely badly so that it was the labor party that reduced the time that private equity had to be invested from 10 years to two years to get this massive tax uh, reduction. That's really not very smart if you actually want companies to be investing in the long term. But secondly, there's no point in creating all this money just to save the economy, right? Trillions were created both in the UK and in the US, unless you also are at the same time creating opportunities for those investments. And hence, you need really smart and strategic, what I would call mission-oriented fiscal policy in the economy, which actually creates the opportunities, whether it's around green investments, the green economy, a new form of sort of digital agenda. If you do that seriously, then this creation of money does more than just save the banks, because that money just ended up back in the banks. It didn't find its way towards the real economy. So a kind of macro sort of solution is you better have smart, strategic, you know, fiscal policy aligned with this monetary policy, and on the micro level, de-financialize big business, because that's bad for skills, it's bad for innovation, it's very good for inequality. Inequality is rising because of that. Now, Torsten, your, your, um, uh, the Resolution Foundation looks at a lot of these issues, has, has certainly identified, and we've done a lot of work with you, certainly identified how real people are experiencing the economy now and why there is this reaction maybe against capitalism. What do you see as some of the um, solutions? Mariano is obviously said that the financial system itself needs to be reformed and the, and the tax system around that, and maybe governments need to be bolder in themselves in being innovators and being entrepreneurial and having some kind of mission-led um, mission approach. What, Torsten, 
for you and the foundation would be things that, that the, the government, that businesses, not just obviously governments don't run economies, businesses should be doing to re-engage the public in the notion that the capitalist market might actually be the best form there is? Um, well, I think a good start would be to step back and say, because at the moment we're, you know, we're talking about lots of individual dates, what happened in April, then what happened in the following autumn, when the history books are written to cover that period, the, um, uh, in kind of 10, 15 years' time, they'll basically say just two things. They'll say uh, Britain had the biggest financial crisis in its history, and then it left the European Union, basically. I think the question, and whatever you think about the, the decision to leave the European Union, I'm going to take a punt on where this audience is, but that's obviously not where the um, whole country will be. The, um, whatever you think about that, that's a pretty suboptimal result from 10 years disaster, basically. The, um, because whatever you think about... A lot of the, hang on, Tom, but a lot of the fundamental problems that we are facing as an economy were there well before... That's what I'm about before, to come on to. Is, yes. no, but, I mean, but what I'm trying to get to <laughs> well is... Well, before the Brexit, what, 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 No, 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 I'm not saying the Brexit results cause any problems yet. Right. There, I'm, making, I'm just making a point, which is the history books will say that. What should they have said? Mm -hmm. Britain had a huge financial crisis. Um, it dealt with that financial crisis actually pretty well in the short term, um, but then it took a good hard look at itself and started sorting out some of the underpinning problems that were there. So, for example, that, that, said, that said, well, we've put up with um, the level of wealth being accumulated by each generation, one or the other, falling for everybody born after 1955. Yeah. So, the peak, who was born in like around 1955? Anyone? You are, like, you are peak wealth for Britain. Maybe not you personally. <laughs> they're, they're, it may not feel like that all the time, but that's because Mervyn wrote the big check. They're, but that, that was the like, and, and we've been going backwards ever since then. So actually, so for example, a generation born in the, early, in the first five years of the 1980s, the first half of the 1980s. Yeah, that's me, yeah. Yep. That's you, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, um, that's the problem with modern politics. All these, li all these lies come up. Uh, the, um, has half the wealth at the same age as people born just five years before. Half. Yeah. Uh, somebody, a man in Manchester today is earning the same as a man in Manchester 17 years ago. Seven Not, zero. No, one seven. One seven. One seven. <laughs> one seven. No, there's bigger problems if you get into seven. <laughs> the, um, I'm saying, and when that, it's those things, as, it's facts like that as much as you know, what exactly has happened to individual banks. Mm. I actually don't think the problem, the next problem for Britain is not banks are going to go bust again. I think that, that will come when people forget why they, we needed these tough regulations in the first time. I don't think that is our problem. Our problem is that too many people look at our country and our economy and say, if that's the best we can do, it's not good enough. And the problem is they're kind of right. So that is, I think, the things we should be doing are addressing those problems. We should be building houses and then restricting people's ability to buy second, third, and other houses if we want to change what the outcome people are seeing. Baby boomers had a 50% higher home ownership rate at 30 than today's millennials. Millennials on average have spent 44,000 pounds more on rent in their 20s than the baby boomers, which is roughly a deposit uh, on a house. So the, um, now, that's slightly unfair, but the, my point is, that is what people are asking for. They're saying, how come we've now got 1.6 million people with, fat, with kids living in the private rented sector, which was just 600,000 10 years ago, yet we've done nothing to increase security for families in the private rented sector. So yes, we should sort out our finance system. Yes, we should sort out our economic theory and our convoluted you know, ideas that underpin a lot of what we do in terms of policy. But what people really want isn't different economic theories. They want different economics. They want us to address some bread and butter issues about better jobs, better housing, cheaper housing, and a better... And I think that is... The, um, that's the real disaster of the last 10 years, is that the energy from the crisis has not been used to fix any of those problems. Do you think, Mervyn, that the emergency moves that were made to rescue, particularly the developed world economies, has actually had as many positive effects as you may have hoped for, or, to go back to Mariana's point, has, in fact, yes, you saved the banks, but actually the money just went into the banks to saving them and didn't really promote this type of economic reform for real people that might have been expected? No, I think the measures that were taken were necessary, but they weren't sufficient. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look... It's very important to distinguish between incomes and wealth mm -hmm. here. They're different phenomena. 
So if we take the figures that Torsten mentioned, which are really quite extraordinary about how the age at which people become homeowners has risen so dramatically in such a short period of time, I think that is entirely accounted for by the fact that long-term real interest rates have fallen to such low levels that house prices relative to incomes have reached extraordinarily high levels. That was an almost me mechanical consequence of very low interest rates. Now, the consequence is that people in my generation found that on paper, at least, we seem much wealthier because our houses are worth phenomenal amounts of money. Of course, it's not clear you can do anything with this unless you want to live in a field, in a tent. <laughs> but nevertheless, it means that younger people cannot borrow mm -hmm. the money to become homeowners. Now, the point about this is that as interest rates go back to normal levels, which I hope over five, ten years they will, then that situation will reverse. And house prices will fall relative to incomes. In other words, we may be in for a long period of very stagnant house prices. And the new young, in 20 years' time, will actually be just as well off as I was in my generation. It's the current generation that will lose out. They will have bought houses if they had been able to do at the peak, and they'll be selling them at the trough. So that's the wealth aspect, which I think time and higher interest rates will resolve. Incomes is a different issue because total income in this country, as it is in the United States and most of the industrialized world, is about 15% below where we would have expected it to be at the beginning of 2007 by now. And I don't think that is something which is easy to change without greater cooperation in the world economy to get back to a more balanced structure. I, I don't want to deny that the issues that Mariana raised aren't important, they are. But nevertheless, this big gap between where we should be and where we are is, I think, directly the result of the fact that we failed to deal with the structural imbalances in the world economy. This is a macroeconomic issue, and we have to get that sorted out. And I think the unfortunate thing was that whereas in 2008, 2009, central banks were absolutely at the, you know, key point of dealing with this crisis, people then thought, oh, well, central banks can do miracles and they are the only game in town. Actually, the role of central banks should have been diminished from you know, 2011 and 12 onwards and the policy responses should have been focused on other issues. Um, but it, as I say, I don't think any one country would have found it easy to get out of this on its own and they haven't. But Mervyn, we've been talking about structural, global structural imbalances for decades. Saver countries don't want to give up being saver countries, and debtor countries are then stuck being debtor countries. And there is never any structural movement, is there particularly? Well, there we is can in keep the end. whacking our, whacking but, our fingers. But in the end, there is, because what will happen is, as happened in the interwar period, the debtor countries default, and the surplus countries which have lent the money and feel they're very affluent because they own lots of claims on other countries, actually don't own anything of any value. And when they realize that, that will be a big shock. So the irony in a way is that Germany, with a very large current account surplus, 8 to 9% of GDP, is accumulating each year almost 10% of its income, annual income, and investing it in claims on other countries. During the interwar period, it was the other way round. And it was the Germans who pointed out quite rightly that how on earth could they be expected to repay debt and meet war reparations if they weren't allowed to earn an export surplus, which will give them the money to repay the debt. And if we are mm -hmm. pushing countries into a situation where they can't get out of this trap, then in the end, rescheduling of debt on a large scale becomes inevitable. Marianne, just for get, so, yeah, to when we talk about the world, I think we should also admit that there was huge differences, actually, in how the world reacted to the crisis. So, you know, Obama had an 800 billion stimulus program. We kind of forgot to do that here. So there was this kind of almost for the first time, I think, since World War II, countries in Europe deciding to be pro-cyclical after a crisis. 
right? I mean, the point of counter-cyclical policies, and I'm talking about mainly fiscal policies, is you know, to get you out of recession so it doesn't turn into a depression. And if you look at the data before World War II, before sort of Keynes and economics came into fashion, there was actually depressions, not just recessions, every 20 or so years. And so the fact that both in the UK, call it austerity, call it what you want, but this lack of serious stimulus, and in Europe, in the Eurozone, this kind of failure to really diagnose the problems of the weakest countries, the so-called pigs, I'm Italian so I'm allowed to say it, but Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, that's a beautiful word coined by Goldman Sachs, where those countries actually were quite weak, not because they had been spending too much, but because they had been spending really kind of stupidly. So Italy, for 20 years, had a zero growth in productivity. Its GDP almost hadn't grown in terms of growth rate in, in, in that period, and so what they actually needed was to rethink you know, the role of public, but also private investment. Private investment had been quite inertial in Italy. So this kind of you know, um, Eurozone kind of mentality that these weak countries just you know, simply needed to cut their public debt in order to get out of the crisis was an obvious huge mistake. The UK, which failed to have a stimulus program, was a huge mistake, and would this lack of growth that you're saying should have you know, come back since the crisis, you know, would we have this stalemate had there been a serious fiscal stimulus? And I think it'd be very hard to argue that it was purely this kind of imbalance between... Well, 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 two sentences re reply, and then we must go to the audience. Okay, very, so very, very <laughs> quick. The problem in the Euro area was not that they had austerity as such, uh, but they had nothing else. They, had no, yeah, they needed exactly. a weaker exchange rate. They needed to devalue. The UK had a 25% depreciation of sterling, and it was reasonable to expect that if you want to rebalance the UK economy to encourage resources to shift to exports, you have a big boost to the incentive to export and to cut back on import substitutes through a depreciation. But what are you and, then, and then you, and then you need to cut to back to some domestic <laughs> spending. So I don't think that was, the, that was the big issue. There are plenty of things going wrong, and there are big issues that Torsten referred to about intergenerational inequality that need dealing with, but they're quite separate, I think, from wealth and income. The wealth one will come right when we get interest rates back. The incomes one will not. Okay. Fantastic. Questions, questions, questions. Now, we have lots of people walking around with um, sort of paddle balls and things. Uh, there's a... Anyone, this gentleman here, which would be great. Um, in terms of the stagnation we have had over the past 10 years and arguably longer in wages, um, is the magic bullet now we have to wait for technology to kick into gear? We have to wait for things like artificial intelligence or the room temperature superconductor, for example, that will... Um, dramatically increase productivity? And is that the magic bullet to get wages up and to get debt, get debt down? Do we have to hold out for technology to come to our aid? Torsten, is it going to save the world? Technology, I mean, probably yes, not. Um, yes, there's a lot of things going on in your question. I mean, in, the, in the very short term, the thing Mervyn said right at the end there, which is about this big depreciation of sterling that happened in uh, 2008, 2009, because people thought that Britain was particularly affected by this crisis, and it actually repeated itself on a smaller scale after the Brexit vote. I actually think one of the things, looking back, Kamal said earlier, what are the big mistakes we made? One of the mistakes is we thought that every recession was like the last recession. So all the planning meetings about what we were going to do to deal with this crisis, apart from leaving aside saving the banks and all that stuff, for the real world, were what well, unemployment will hit 3 million, as it had in the 80s and 90s, repossessions will go through the roof, and insolvencies will increase significantly. All three predictions that were wrong. Now, and there's reasons for that, although the big one is low interest rate environment that we, was not the same as the 80s and 90s. The big thing we missed is that that depreciation fed through to a very big spike, along with some oil price changes in inflation around that time, that suppressed real wages significantly in a way we hadn't seen before, and we've actually never seen before. And then right the way through from then till 2014, wages are falling. And we're now, we then had a small mini boom in 2014-15, bit of 16, which was basically very low inflation. Not, it's not that wages, it's not that everyone's been getting wage rises, inflation was just very low. The, um, now, and then since Brexit, high inflation again, falling real wages again. So even today, 10 years on from the financial crisis, real wages are 15 pounds a week, lower than they were at the time of the crisis. Now, what's gonna get us out of that? Well, inflation is slowly, is likely to recede, 
slightly. But also, the question was, will technology get us out of that? Not what is. Well, I don't think, well, technology is what it is. I don't think, one, is. I mean, Marianne is a much better place to talk about what we can do to boost that. But that is, that is kind of happening. I don't think that is, that can be the answer, though, to our, you know, there's, there are reasons when firms need to invest to use technology. If you look at, if you spend time up in Sheffield, you can spend time with the manufacturing firms there, and you wonder why Sheffield has a very high level of low pay. It's not that technology doesn't exist, it's that firms do not use it. Like they have very bad management and they have very low take up of technology. And you say to them, you know, how's things going in Sheffield? And they say, oh, well, it's going okay. And you say, no, it's really not. You know, it's really not. Or you say to some of our sectors, so in hospitality today, 61% of the workforce is low paid. 61%. And you say to them, you know, there are constraints. Clearly, don't want people who don't want to pay more than they have to for their hotel room or their food. But we have also got business models based on not taking up technology in some cases. Now, what's happening right now is a big experiment, actually, in this area. Because in Britain, what we're about to do is significantly reduce our input of low-paid labor. And we're putting up the price of low-paid labor. The earnings inequality in Britain is falling quite significantly at the moment because of the national living wage, the minimum wage is rising fast, and everybody else is basically flat. Yeah? So earnings inequality is fall overall inequality is not falling, but earnings inequality is falling. And for the labor market, that combined with falling migration is a huge, huge change. And that is actually what is more likely. I think it's more likely that the minimum wage, higher wages, will push technology. As in, if it's more expensive to hire people, you instead go and get some technology rather than technology causing the... Mariani, I, I, I overheard a big sigh from you there. What, what, what were you worried about, Thorsten <laughs> was saying? <laughs> well, is, is technology, is technology <laughs> gonna, 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 do, um, so gonna help us out of this? Technology occurs within sort of a system, right? And technology has never been the sort of panacea. Even think of mass production, which was a huge technological kind of revolution, actually organizational revolution of how production occurred, which many researchers have shown actually then created all sorts of growth in the economy. That wouldn't have happened without other things happening at the same time. In that particular instance, without suburbanization, people actually moving to the suburbs, these new um, mass-produced things, whether they were cars or washing machines, would not have actually become fully diffused and fully deployed throughout the whole economy. So when today, um, I don't know if you know Robert Gordon, but he's quite funny when he does this, when he puts up uh, the indoor toilet here and the internet there and says, you know, if you had to get rid of one, which would you get rid of? You had to go outside, <laughs> think of today, right? And his point being, you know, God, actually electricity and the indoor toilet have done much more for our economy than the internet where people are just, you know, on their jobs searching for whatever. Uh, shopping on Amazon, that kind of misses the point, which the real question should be, have we actually had today some ambitious uh, policies that have actually allowed, for example, ICT, information communication technologies, to get fully deployed and fully diffused throughout the whole economy? And could we, for example, imagine some really bold green policies, all this stuff about sustainable cities, but also the kind of energy vendor kind of policies that they have in Germany, to provide a new direction also for IT? let alone all these new sort of, you know, advents and things like AI and big data, those as well could be used for some things or others. And I'm always struck by how, you know, there's this lack of application, for example, of big data to certain social problems. So remember the bedroom tax, right? Mm -hmm. It was like the stupidest equation. It's like, how many bedrooms do you have? How many children do you have? If one's bigger than the other, you're out, right? So in a world of big data, wouldn't it have been interesting if we had really you know, complex algorithms and not just plus, minus, divided by, equals, whatever, to actually make much more informed decisions on things like housing policy and you know, improve the welfare state through the use of AI and big data versus simply allowing big data to, you know, basically improve things like personalized medicine. So there's choices to be made on how we use existing technologies to really distribute them through advances in the real economy, including improving the welfare state, which I think is under incredible stress right now, but also any of these new innovations, not just existing technologies, the new ones, won't actually create long-run productivity and long-run growth without also these demand-side policies. And personally, I think those demand-side policies must bring us to a new, greener form of production, distribution, and consumption. Excellent. All right, so gentlemen here, it's actually um, Tez Parrick, senior economist with the Institute for Economic Affairs. Uh, sorry. Institute of Directors, sorry. Institute of Directors. Tej, please, um, your floor is yours for a second or two. Okay, thank you. Um, so it strikes me that like, a key theme here is uh, the role of short-termism. It, it clearly played a massive role on 
trading floors during the financial crisis, but it also played a key role in terms of policy making and regulation, um, in terms of not being able to horizon scan and foresee risks. Now, myopia is a very inherent, inbuilt human aspect. Um, and obviously at the Institute of Directors, we work with businesses to try and improve their corporate governance models to kind of shift from the short-term focus on profiteering to looking at uh, long-term um, cre value creation that mm -hmm. creates more sustainable business models. I think the challenge really is, is how we can transfer that long-term governance to uh, the policymakers and policymaking because inherently the political cycle is five years long and when we're trying to deal with crises in the global economy, whether that's through technology, through financial risk, we need to start thinking decades ahead. So I, I was wondering what um, solutions or um, innovations you might have to our institutional structures that could try and engender that long-termism in our political system. Mervyn, did you have, how much of an issue was the short-termism of the political process and the need for results in that type of cycle that um, Tej touches on, in terms of making long-run, sensible regulatory decisions? The notion of, true or otherwise, light-touch regulation was a way of encouraging financial centres to locate in London and that we were going to be the friend of the financial centres. So I two comments on this, one about business and one about government and politicians. On the business front, I used to, every month, go out and visit a region in the UK economy and visit lots of companies. And over the years I was governor, I went to an awful lot of companies. And one thing which struck me was that the best companies I saw were very often private companies. And the reason was that they weren't subject to this tyranny of the quarterly reporting season in which they were supposed to say, why haven't your earnings gone up by 10% over the previous quarter? They actually could say, well, we, we believe in what we're doing. We have a product we think will succeed. and We want to make it work. And all the people I met who impressed me, even in very rundown factories, even in family firms where the same people were directors as the great, great, great grandfathers 150 years ago, what distinguished them from companies that weren't so successful was that they were passionate about the product that they were making. That could be plates in Stoke-on-Trent, it could be bread in different places I went to, it could be any steel, anything, engineering products. But they were all passionate about their product. So I do think short-termism short brought about by this focus on very short-term returns on assets and short-term volatility is a major issue. The second one in government is I was always um, struck by how many of the p politicians I work with were very focused not just on tomorrow morning's headlines, but on tonight's uh, stories on BBC. So they didn't Quite even rightly. wait to the next morning. They were <laughs> focusing on what was in there. And that is what generates an excessive focus on you know, short-term announcements. It, policy has become announcements rather than thinking about measures that are implemented. And in the good old days, there were, this is a slight exaggeration, but there's a real kernel of truth to it. When people were elected and formed a government, they breathed a sigh of relief and said, well, we don't have to campaign anymore for another four or five years. We can actually focus on governing for four or five years. No longer. I think after Bill Clinton, we're in a world now in which you win an election and the next day you start campaigning all over again. And that focus on short-termism really does alter the ability of politicians to feel that they're not under the pressure to come up with some immediate answer. You know, every day they're expected to make statements, to answer questions, to have answers to everything. I mean, I used to go to the House of Commons Treasury Committee, and I'd say quite often, I don't know. They regarded this as a totally appalling answer. <laughs> and, but for politicians, the <laughs> politicians are asked many questions on every subject, okay. and on every single one, they're expected to have the answer. Yeah. That, that makes absolutely no sense, because then you do get superficial responses. Just very shortly, Torsten and, and Marianna, Torsten, what's your sense of 
Tej's point about the governance issue. I mean, Marina, you've, yeah. you've touched on it a lot, actually. You're saying it's, it's the key issue alongside financialization. I mean, Torsten, is that is the problem that businesses are just poorly run? And also, just to yeah. poke a bit at Mervyn, um, the notion of private companies, of course, in terms mm -hmm. of transparency, you give up a lot yeah. on in terms of being able to scrutinize private companies in return, maybe, for this more long-term focus. Yeah, I mean, on, so on, I think your question was, shouldn't politics learn a bit more from the increasingly long-term business? I think I'm probably a bit more on the both are rubbish um, uh, at it. On, on the, purely on the private companies, I mean, I agree with Mervyn on private broadly defined. That is, what you're, that is my experience visiting companies too. I remember visiting a company up in um, Cambridge a few years back and they said to me, they set the company up in, I think it had been the late 80s. And I said, how did you get your company set up? And they said, um, I've never heard anybody else give this answer. They said, we had a loan from Barclays. And I said, uh, oh, right. And they, I said, what kind of loan? A 30-year loan from Barclays. Right. The mo if you, to get a five-year loan from Barclays now, you'd probably have to put your house up against it. You would have to put your house up against it. This company had got an un, you know, unsecured 30-year loan, which they had run their business on. They had no quarterly reporting, except insofar as they wanted it themselves. So that is definitely right. I'm not sure I agree about family-run firms being because of the productivity challenge for lots of them, but clearly some are very good. But you do see a big productivity drop off when you pass a firm over to the kids in general. You can't trust your kids to run your company, it turns out. They, um, on the politics short termism, yeah. um, so Mervyn is 100% right that the, the pressures are, um, I definitely don't want to sound holier than thou now, but the pressures are significant. The structural pressures towards short termism are real and significant. 24 hour media cycle, everything you've read about, people like this hassling you, you just wish they'd stop hassling you. Then that kind of stuff. People is all, like this, why are you me? You, <laughs> right, you, you're, you're, you're sorry, this. sorry. The, these two are fine. <laughs> right. You're the problem. Okay. The, so that's a bit irritating. Um, but all I would say, without, before we get kind of let all politicians off the hook, again, when we reflect back on this decade, and in particular, um, some of the phase post. Brexit. I do think some of it is it's not just about the structure, it's about the leadership and it's about uh, uh, do people see it as their job to bring the country together again and to chart a kind of different direction as I was saying that addresses some of these core underlying problems or is it just what can I do to kind of exploit this division or play this game now and I, my view is that it is not the punters that are to blame for the lack of that, it is a leadership vacuum. Yeah. Can I just number three, yes Mara, carry on, number three and then number four. Number three, there's a the gentleman just in front of here as well who's been waiting for a long time. But number three, yes, sir. And then a gentleman here. The new populists are in the business of stoking up anger and then directing it or... Peter, can you introduce yourself? Uh, Peter York. <laughs> um, the new populists are in the business of stoking up anger and then they direct it or they redirect it. They divert it. But who should people be angry with? by which I mean the victims of the situation you've all described, the financialization situation, finance, finances, finance, the most wonderful phrase ever. And how should that anger be seen as relating to the anger that has been stoked up? The anger that's been stoked up by Trump and the anger that's been stoked up by the Brexit merchants. How do they align? Thank you, Peter. Let's have a number four. Just hang on before we come to that. Number four. Good evening. I wanted to engage with some of the points Mariana raised. Specifically, I think, an oversimplified argument about share buybacks. So this, this isn't really about uh, boosting executive pay. I think the bigger issue here is inequality and the implications of that. So when you have elevated asset prices, who that really benefits are people who have pensions or own a house or have an ISA. So what, what that argument really re relates to isn't productivity and the misspending of the productivity dividend. It's to do with those who own assets on the right or center of wealth distribution and those on the left side of wealth distribution who don't own any assets. And then the second point connected to this is this really dangerous idea about picking winners in the economy. So this idea of fiscal spending targeted at specific industries. We tried that in this country, and it ended in the 1970s. We need to avoid going back to policies like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Merv, I'm going to talk with Peter's question. Who should the people be angry with, and who have Trump and the... What did you say, Peter? The Brexit 
the Brexiteers, have they been stoking up anger of a different type? So who should people be angry with, first off, about the, the well, situation I, they find I themselves? I want to do it the other way around, because I don't right. think the anger has been stoked up from nothing. The anger was there. I remember uh, at the Bank of England, during and after the financial crisis, the immediate aftermath of it, holding dinners at the bank, when I would ask people, why is it the case that we're not seeing more anger? I had expected that we'd see more anger. Now, I think the measures taken by central banks and governments to prevent unemployment rising as much, uh, it did rise, but it didn't rise as much as it did in the Great Depression, helped to put a lid on the anger in the short term. But I think people could see as time passed that since the, the cost of the crisis in terms of GDP was very real and it was spread you know, perhaps more on lower income people than higher income people, the anger was there, it was genuine, it was real. So I think that you know, much of what we've seen in the last few years, in, uh, right across countries, it's not just the UK, it's not just the US with Trump, I think in Europe too, people have been voting not for candidates, but against the establishment and the people who were there before. So I think there is a real sense of anger, as Torsten said earlier, that actually the, the economy is not delivering what they had bought into. After all, in the previous 25 years, uh, people have been told, very much by people in the financial sector, that if they would accept market discipline, uh, a more flexible labor market, uh, if you work for a company and there aren't any customers, you shouldn't expect the government to bail you out. If they accepted this approach to market discipline, then productivity would grow faster, incomes would rise, we'd all be better off. And of course, it looked as though that had worked, except when it came to the financial crisis, the market discipline didn't seem to be applied to the banks. It wasn't, they were bailed out. Now, that was done for good reason, to prevent not the banks from suffering, but other people. But nevertheless, it looked like that. And so this, this anger is very real. And I think that we've seen it come through. I predicted it would come through. And we've seen it right across the industrialized world. And it, it is, in my view, correlated with countries that experience the financial crisis. You don't see this in the same way anywhere near as much in Asia, which had their own financial crisis much earlier, or Latin America. So it's a crisis of the industrialized world. Now, the anger, I think, is it's, it's at the way we have chosen to govern ourselves and our economy. And it's, I would put it more deeply, saying it's a, people should be angry about an intellectual failure. Mm -hmm. It's a failure of ideas to put forward solutions to the problems which they see as... Is it being fed to them? by so I mean, Peter mentioned um, Trump, Peter mentioned uh, Brexit. Is it being fed by people who want to break the present system in a way that is good for them and, but it could be negative more broadly. No, I think that if you look at the United States, so we don't get bogged down in Brexit here, look at the United States, which is perhaps the most extreme case, there is absolutely no doubt that the elite as represented by Hillary Clinton were absolutely, there was no sign that they actually understood the problems that were being suffered by many people in the rest of the United States. And the opioid crisis in the US has led to mortality of white people overall rising in the US. It's not true of the black population, it's not true of the Hispanic population. It is true of the white population. It's basically largely people with lower levels of educational attainment. But the last time we saw mortality rising was when uh, the Soviet Union broke up and we thought that rising mortality was a sign of chaos in Russia, alcoholism and so on. We have it here in the United States and it's coming to the UK. We're beginning to see increases in mortality here. And what do people think is the big issue? It's political correctness, it's, it's other issues. It isn't actually getting to grips with the problems that many ordinary people feel they face. That is the crisis and that's where much of the anger is coming from. Marianne, how did you respond to the sure. criticisms from there? So, I'll take both, just really quickly. Yeah. So this year on share buybacks, so you're, you basically just outlined what happens after that, right? Which is that asset prices then get inflated. But the point of share buybacks is this whole issue of reinvestment. By the way, we've been looking at the degree to which you have the share buybacks, of which many, you know, the extent to which 
we have them was actually illegal. It was actually illegal under the Securities and Exchange Commission um, in the 1980s. And then all of a sudden it was sort of allowed. And I would argue that this is um, a, a crisis of the kind of deals that are being struck. So when you have a record level hoarding, which we have in both Europe and the US, over two trillion dollars being hoarded, so inert capital in the US, over two trillion euros in uh, Europe, record level financialization, and again, just look at the share buyback figures, just the extent to which they've increased, that's also a, a reflection of the lack of, in some ways, confidence, coming back to the the public sector, so not just politicians, but the public sector agencies, which are often giving out these massive subsidies, of which some may be problematic, and I'll get to that in a second, used to actually be in exchange for the private sector doing its part, which was investing. So coming back to the issue of innovation, Bell Labs, which you might have heard of, which is, was one of the most famous kind of private sector R&D laboratories, actually came from a period in history where the US government, in order to grant a monopoly, in this case to AT&T, said, you know, these profits that are being generated from a government-granted, not God-granted monopoly have to be reinvested back into the economy, into innovation, big innovation beyond telecoms. And that's where Bell Labs was formed. And I would argue that the recent Carillion and, and Capita crisis here, this issue around outsourcing, it's not about public or private, it's the lack of deal. You don't just give out a contract, even to Virgin, with the rail without making it conditional on the private actors then investing in the improvement of the rail and improvement of the health system or the prisons versus even allowing that to become a short-term sort of speculative area. Um, in terms of the picking winners, I mean, to be honest, that is the most ideological debate. Obviously, we should not go back to the 1970s style just kind of picking a firm or a sector. One of the ways to really revive industrial strategies to take, which by the way this country is trying to do with Greg Clark, is to take away the emphasis on sectors and to focus on problems. What are the big problems afflicting British society? and especially perhaps choosing those that have some sort of societal value that citizens care about, but transforming them into problems that require investment across many different sectors. Going to the moon required 12 different sectors, 400 homework problems, of which 200 failed. Along the way, everything in your iPhone kind of happened, right? So internet, GPS, touchscreen, even Siri in some ways, uh, traces its initial funding uh, 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 to that era. So what are the problems that we could actually use to guide fiscal policy, investment policy, and industrial strategy? This constant ideological backlash that that means picking winners, and so at best government should just kind of redistribute income or just get the tax policy right and then get the hell out of the way, would not have gotten us any of the technologies inside your iPhone. Mariana, thank you. Number three, and then there's... Uh a couple of uh, younger people down here. Brilliant. Number three, yeah. Hi. Um, Maxwell Rigby of City of London School. Uh, this question isn't directed or isn't uh, just directed at Mervyn King. Um, but you seem to be an advocate believer uh, of the cooperation of the global economy. Where do uh, countries like the US and China begin in fixing the situation that they're in with US owing China so much money. Okay, so we have that, Mervyn, and then gentleman down here. Yeah. What do you think is the future of the banking system, especially after post-Brexit and Trump's America? Um, and now that there is an increasing, uh, now that there is increasing um, amount of people with disposable income, uh, they, there's less need to borrow, so could that lead to a bigger recession or crisis, or will the banking system find its ground and be stable? And you also said that there could be uh, that executives should have a mission-led approach, and in theory this may sound good, but in practice this may not work as well and be as effective. Okay, um, so Mervyn, China, US, uh, and the dynamic between that. I didn't quite understand that you said so, Mervyn had been a backer for the global sort of corporate economy. No, was that? Cooperation. Cooperation. Co yeah. so a cooperation. Sorry, I thought it was a cooperation. Cooperation. Yeah. The, if you look at the world economy today, there are two countries or groups which have large surpluses, China and the European uh, Monetary Union. 
fact, the euro is the biggest uh, contributor to surpluses today. And there are two countries with big deficits, the US and the UK. If you had those four countries in a room and said, look, if we go on like this, we'll have another crisis of some kind, rather than debate endlessly what the crisis will look like, why don't we do something to stop it happening by trying gradually to eliminate these surpluses and deficits, there is a basis for a deal. And it takes four people in one room to come to an agreement on the timetable over which they might be able to achieve it. And I think that's worth trying, and I think the IMF should play the role of behind the scenes, the person providing the advice and the help and so on. Very briefly on banking, I do think we should put in place some measures, uh, an ex-ante framework, which everyone buys into, so that we say, if there's another crisis, then the central bank will be on hand to lend money to banks but only because banks have been made to pay an insurance premium in advance in all the good years in order to be entitled to the borrowing in a crisis. So the word bailout would disappear. It would be, well, the banks have been paying for this for years and years, now they're entitled to borrow. The political problem comes, if you don't actually charge banks for this in the good years, you can't blame people for... <laughs> being upset when the banks get a free ride in the crisis, even though when the crisis comes, it's the right thing to do. And since it is the right thing to do, which is to lend money to the banks in a crisis, the right thing to do is not to pretend that we'll never lend to them, but actually to create a framework that everyone buys into. And this is where the US is going badly wrong, because Congress is trying to stop the Fed from lending to banks in a crisis. Actually, what they need to do is to say, we know they're going to do it, so what's the price that banks will pay in, in every good year? Torsten, how active, touch on the gentleman's question here, how active should governments be? This notion of mission-led approach, Marianne's idea that innovation comes from proactive, active state action. Not only. Um, well, I kind of think it's, in some, without, being, without being rude, um, <laughs> they are active. And the question is just, what are they active in? and what are they doing? And, where, and when they're inactive in certain areas, that's usually an active choice in of itself. I think, I think the, I mean, Mariana's talking about getting innovation going and the role of the state in encouraging and doing some of that research that the private sector can then take up and run with it. Uh, just stepping back from that to, my worry is more that the British state has become inactive mm -hmm. in the face of a whole f host of structural challenges to who our economy works for and how we deal with it. And that does not require particularly complicated economics. It does not require particularly big theories about how the world works. It is requires, look, we have chosen as a society not to build any social housing in large numbers since the 1980s. That's just a choice. Yeah. Now, it's not cheap, it's not easy, there are upsides, there are downsides, but we have made that decision. We can reverse that tomorrow. Okay, two final very brief points. Uh, number two, I think, was there, sorry, yes, number two. While we've been speaking tonight, the U.S. stock market has been down more than 5.8% in the lowest fall since September 2008. So, what's going on? Okay. <laughs> Is he asking Excellent. for investment advice? <laughs> BBC doesn't give him that. So I think there's one more uh, over this direction, wasn't there? Yeah. Just a quick question from Mervyn King. So, you said after the Brexit vote that you, you were ultimately very strongly critical of the Treasury forecast, and you said they were really over the top. And ultimately, we didn't actually know what was going to really happen. Uh, but kind of more recently, that's kind of quite a topical issue now in the wake of the, the criticism of the latest Treasury forecast by prominent Brexiteers. And so I was just wondering what your views on those latest forecasts were, like how that's kind of different compared to your original criticisms in the first place. Excellent. OK, so let's go through very briefly. We're aware that it's now 8.30, sadly. Mariana, stock markets, are, um, are they correcting themselves, finally understanding that they've just been too frothy? Well... Today, I read an article in the FT that was actually saying that the reason they're flopping is the worry about inflation from the rise in real wages, which just kind of highlights how messed up things are. So if real wages are finally rising in the US, in theory, that would be good news, not bad news. And the fact that we then just look at the stock market as a sort of thermometer down the throat of the economy to say, is this good or is that bad, versus how can we restructure the economy to be less again, driven by shareholder returns, which of course the stock market is reflecting, you know, is the big question. Um, can I just say one thing about yeah. missions? Yes, <laughs> which is, one briefly. 
the point is not government or not government. As I've already said, you know, Google's algorithm came from a government investment. Elon Musk, five billion of government investment into basically everything he did. That's not the problem. That's kind of an old story. The question is, what do we want to create? Do we want a greener economy? Do we want AI? How do we get public and private partnerships that are more symbiotic and mutualistic and less parasitic? And if we keep going back to this, is it the state, is it the market? Unfortunately, we're not going to get a new conversation. So especially these wonderful young people here, change the conversation. <laughs> Torsten, uh, is this the start of the massive uh, equities correction? Are we going to go become uh, I've all not, bears? I've no idea. Let's hope not. I mean, the, um, obviously, the US, the US stock market in particular over the last year, all stock markets around the world have had, with the exception of the UK, have had a pretty strong um, year. So 6% is, is only undoing an element of that. But yeah, I'll be slightly surprised if it's still 6% by tomorrow night, but we shall uh, find out. And Mervyn, quick line on the stock markets, but I think more people in here may be more interested in your views of forecasts uh, <laughs> and conditional analyses, if we're going to be uh, more precise about the recent Treasury paper on that issue. Um, uh, but anyway, stock markets and then our forecasts, rubbish. If we were on the BBC, Kamal, your producer would have cut you off two minutes ago. She would have so I should be, <laughs> I'm I, sorry. I, I should be brief. Uh, one, as I said earlier this evening, when interest rates start to rise, asset prices will fall back relative to incomes. Well, that was a pretty good prediction because they obviously have been rising, <laughs> uh, falling back relative They're to incomes. They're listening to you on Wall Street. <laughs> um, well, obviously someone was tweeting to, uh, to Wall Street. One of the problems in the referendum campaign was that, and too many economists fell into this trap in my view, they pretended that they actually could put forward precise quantitative figures and have credibility. Economists are very good at framing arguments. So the arguments that economists framed about the possible consequences of Brexit, that would have been a useful contribution. But when people said every family will be 4,300 pounds worse off, that was very foolish because any non-economist would say, I don't understand the economics of this, but I'm absolutely sure that they cannot possibly know that everyone's going to be £4,300 worse off, and they're trying to con me. And I'm afraid that was a rational response to the claims. And I think this use of precise figures is, is dangerous, and if you go too far down that road, you end up making the numbers up. So. I think we should be pretty cautious about precise figures and numbers. Thank you so much. It is 8.33. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you to Intelligence Squared. Thank you, Torsten, Mervyn, and Mariana. And thank you for coming.